Nasseria, where which is the town into which the 507th sort of uh, found themselves, and that's where the attack happened. This was south east of Baghdad. But we're not in Nasseria. We're in an industrial zone outside Dallas in the set of the made-for-TV movie Saving Private Jessica, based on a hotly disputed episode in the Iraq War. Todd Breeza was a military advisor overseeing the project for the Pentagon. I believe this, I believe this is the mosque, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Here we go, guys. Protect your ears. Fire in the hole. Let me come back. Okay, let's let's work on standing straight. Yeah. And just you're, you're just going to have to. Laura Regan plays the heroine Jessica Lynch. At this point, the film script was still a heavily guarded secret. But the story that inspired it caused much ink to flow. Jessica's story made headlines around the globe. I'm proud to be a soldier in the Army. I'm proud to have served with the 507th. According to the Pentagon, the young soldier's unit was ambushed. She fought fiercely against her Iraqi attackers. The official version also says Jessica was shot and mistreated by her captors until she was saved by the American army. Her story received massive publicity. Coalition forces have conducted a successful rescue mission of a U.S. Army prisoner of war held captive in Iraq. But a few weeks later, in a dramatic turn of events, the Washington Post and the BBC reported that Lynch's rescue was an army stunt. Her unit had had a road traffic accident. Her Iraqi doctors even tried to turn her over to army authorities, a version the U.S. military still disputes. The army and the movie's producers spent a long time discussing the controversy surrounding Lynch's story. Major Breezel says the script incorporates elements of both versions. If we stick just with what the military has to say, it's going to be a boring picture. <laughs> it's going to be boring. Uh, so what we do is uh, we just try to combine all the material that's out there, the, the BBC, the Washington Post, um, uh, Stone Phillips from, from NBC interviewed a bunch of the former POWs. Uh, all these sources come together and really sort of flesh out and make uh, more obvious the story. But it's impossible to get a look at the script. Oh, we do know that all changes must be passed by Todd Breezel. You know, look at this, this are, you know, what is that, 30 pages of new changes. A military official shepherding a film script may surprise some, but the project's producers wanted the army involved in the making of their film, a request that is far from unusual. Most American war movies made since World War II have had direct help from the American army. The long list includes famous movies like Pearl Harbor, Black Hawk Down, Top Gun, Wind Talkers, and We Were Soldiers. The Pentagon even set up a direct link to Hollywood, opening its own office in this building in downtown Los Angeles. The U.S. Navy, Air Force, Army, and Marines all work out of this office. Each military branch is directly involved in films that portray it in action. Lieutenant Joshua Rushing is second in command at the Marine Motion Picture Liaison Center. Here's the file on Top Gun and uh, the script for Top Gun with Paramount. Lieutenant Rushing's job is to review scripts, make corrections, and propose changes that would give a more accurate portrayal of the Marines. On, on this one, for example, the kind of rifle they had in the beginning, the writer puts in an M4 rifle, which we don't use, and so uh, we changed that to an M16A4. Uh, sometimes the Navy and the Marine Corps are so close to the writer that they get our roles a little mixed up, so I we'll think they had the Navy here where maybe it should have been the Marine Corps. When he's done, his notes go to Washington. Like this one, it's all kind of flagged, and it'll generally have notes and be written on. Uh, you'll find notes written throughout here. I'll, I'll uh, take an email and I'll, I'll do up, up all the pages that I have problems or questions about and, and uh, just enumerate those for the producer. And then I email them to the producer and to the Pentagon, um, our boss up at the Pentagon, so he knows what we're doing and what concerns we have. The 
final decision on whether the military will be involved in filming a war movie or not is made at the Defense Department in Washington. A special bureau handles all relations between the military and the entertainment industry. It is headed by retired Navy Colonel Philip Strupp. When filmmakers approach us with a request for military production assistance, we see this as a great opportunity to tell the American public something about the U.S. military and help recruiting and retention at the same time. And we've seen recently in surveys that large numbers of Americans base their primary impressions of the U.S. military from entertainment movies and TV shows, a, a significant number of people. So it's even proved scientifically that it's in our best interest to, to try to be involved in the process. Top Gun, made in 1986, marks a milestone in the history of the military's cooperation with the entertainment industry. This huge box office hit turned around the military's flagging image. The U.S. Air Force saw a sharp jump in recruiting, and Tom Cruise's glamorous charm certainly had something to do with it. The military had finally put the Vietnam War behind it, and with it, films like Apocalypse Now, Deer Hunter, and Coming Home. All made without the military's support. These highly critical films damage the credibility of the armed forces. In 1942, the Pentagon opened a motion picture liaison office in Los Angeles. The goal was to put out films with a clear agenda, propaganda. Renowned actors and filmmakers put their talents in the service of the military. James Stewart, Clark Gable, Henry Fonda, John Ford, and Howard Hawks, among others. But the capstone was director Frank Capra. He made a documentary series called Why We Fight, tailored for the military, to help rally the country to support the war effort. And no one really minded when the cause seemed so just. Back on the Jessica Lynch film set, Todd Breezel checks equipment the Army loaned to the production. Are there batteries in the case? Uh, batteries there are in the compartment. Okay. For me, it's important if you're going to portray the military, you need to get it as right as possible. And if I can have any control over issues like night vision goggles or the model of tank that's used, then I'm going to exercise that. Depending on the film, the military can lend out trucks, tanks, aircraft carriers, or fighter jets. It's hard to measure how much film producers save, but it's a tidy sum. A simple takeoff is free, but if you want a stunt, it costs more, $16,000 an hour. So is the military simply renting out equipment? We sign a contract with the filmmakers, and the contract says, essentially, we're going to give you this, this equipment on these days, um, based on this particular version of the script, and you will show us edited sequences as we go along, just to see if, in general, it conforms to what we agreed on. But it also says we will not seek injunctive action. In other words, we say we will not go to court to try to prevent this film from being exhibited. We'd never dream of doing anything like that, never want to do anything like that. But there is indeed a very restrictive contract. The production should help armed forces recruiting and retention programs. The production company agrees to consult with the DOD project office in all phases of pre-production, production, and post-production that involve the military or depict the military. All production companies who sign this contract agree to comply with the military's demands. An example, Ridley Scott's Black Hawk Down, produced by Jerry Bruckheimer and released in 2001. The film is based on the battle for Mogadishu in October 1993. The bloody U.S. foray ended in total humiliation for the Rangers. Pictures of the bodies of U.S. soldiers being dragged through the city's streets shocked America and brought an immediate withdrawal of U.S. troops from Somalia. Never again, said Americans, the Mogadishu syndrome was born. But the military had no objections about helping Scott's film. The Pentagon had reacted positively to the book on which it was based, Black Hawk Down by Mark Bowden. While the journalist makes no secret of the U.S. defeat, his amazing portrayal of the battle paints the American army in a heroic fashion. The decision that Ridley made, and I think it's a, it was a fair decision, was that primarily the story of Black Hawk Down is the story of a group of American soldiers who go through this ordeal. 
and he focused uh, his telling of the story through the eyes of those soldiers. The film shot in Morocco told the story of the battle itself and nothing more. It gives no political background. The Somali point of view isn't considered. What's more, Ridley Scott made numerous changes to please the army. Well, one of the changes was at the army's request, a soldier named John Stebbins, who you see here in this explosion, played by uh, Ewan McGregor in the film. Uh, in later life, in um, a couple years after the battle, he was convicted of rape and child molestation, Stebbins was, and is serving a prison term. So the army asked the uh, filmmakers to change his name in the film because they didn't want to glorify John Stebbins, and so Stebbins became Grimes. The trade-off involved when you consider that in order to make an authentic uh, depiction of this battle, we needed the Army's cooperation for Black Hawk helicopters and Little Bird helicopters and Rangers who could do stunts. And, you know, if you weigh all that against the possibility of losing that kind of cooperation, just changing this one character's name, uh, I didn't think that it was a very big uh, sacrifice. These changes may seem minor at first, but the Army also asked the director to cut two key scenes out of the original script. Kathleen Canham Ross has headed the Los Angeles branch of the Army Office of Public Affairs for 20 years. She negotiated the script changes with the producer. There were uh, a couple of things that had to be changed. One, of course, was turning this one person into a superhero, going off on his own to save other people and not following any sort of procedures and having no support and not telling anybody what he's doing. That had to be changed because that just wouldn't have happened. That was a major one. And then another one that was major is the original script had a lot of conflict between the two different army units, the, uh, the Rangers and the Special Forces people, uh, which was, gave the, the script, it gave a little drama to the script but it wasn't accurate as to how the real relationships were between the two of them. Ridley Scott went ahead and filmed a scene that never made it into the movie, showing the tensions between the two units. This scene depicts an incident which actually happened during the battle, when the Delta Force operators started taking fire from the Rangers outside. And as you see depicted, they radioed outside to the commander of the Rangers, telling them to stop firing at them. Uh, it's clearly uh, the kind of mistake that often happens during battle. Um, it, it ended up being filmed, as you see, but was deleted from the movie. Army censorship, self-censorship from the director, Ridley Scott would only say that he cut the scene for artistic reasons. Delighted by Ridley Scott's version of the events, the Pentagon took an unusual move, going all out for a film it wanted released at all costs. Eight helicopters and a hundred and I think it was about 135 people. This is like taking a little army company into Morocco and we didn't have in Morocco what we call a, a status of forces agreement with the country of Morocco. So um, the Department of Defense had to work with um, the government of Morocco in order to allow having military come in because there wasn't any established um, protocol for doing that. And if a filmmaker wouldn't agree to a suggestion that you make, what does it mean? It just means that they make the films without us, and it happens all the time. That was the case with Forrest Gump, a character too dim-witted for the Army's taste. The Thin Red Line was also turned down. Generals don't look kindly on soldiers who entertain doubts. Oliver Stone's platoon, released in 1986, didn't win the Army's support either. While the movie didn't criticize the Vietnam War, military officials didn't like its portrayal of distraught GIs racked by doubts, committing atrociously violent acts against Vietnamese civilians. So this was, I think, the Army's objection, was every combat patrol was, every soldier acted this way. Every time they went out, there was a fight between the NCOs. You know, they burned villages and they raped women every time they went out. This is the way the war was in Vietnam. And I think, frankly speaking, a lot of people think it was that way because of the movie Platoon. Without Army support, it took Oliver Stone 10 years to come up with the money to make his film. He had to go all the way to the Philippines to get the equipment he needed. We had uh, two helicopters, and they were old World War II helicopters, the Huey 
helicopters. We needed one jet fighter. We needed two armored personnel carriers. We needed uniforms for all of the, uh, the VC, uh, the Viet Cong uh, soldiers. We needed uniforms and men, and we needed the rifles and small arms equipment. And we made all of those arrangements. But in the case where I needed the Apache helicopter or where I needed an aircraft carrier, it's either you work with the government or you don't work at all. By the success of Oscar-winning films like Platoon forced the military to rethink its strategy. It is now more flexible. Scripts it refused in the past could expect a warmer welcome today. This is a movie we did not support. A Few Good Men. It, it's a, a really good movie. Uh, Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson. Uh, it, it wasn't supported at the time, I think, because of that. It was about a Marine that killed another Marine. But in today's, in this office today, we, we've talked about this specific movie as an example we probably would have supported it because of although it shows Marines that did bad things, in the end, they were all caught and, uh, and the truth came out. The Army has gone one step further. It is willing to turn a blind eye when military truth is twisted in order to keep its hand in a movie. Only one thing really matters. The military's image cannot be tarnished. The JAG TV series about military judges is a good example of this. A big hit in the U.S. for the past eight years, though every episode is riddled with implausible situations. Scott Silliman is a retired military judge and a law professor. He acknowledges the inconsistencies, but defends the military's tactic. Here we have again our heroes. We're seeing a scene uh, back in Afghanistan. Uh, this is a lawyer, and a lawyer would not normally go on what we call a special operations mission. Those on the service that are asked to advise on shows like this, I think are looking for what I might call the 90% rule. Uh, if individuals look good in the uniform, uh, if they show respect to senior officers the way this series obviously does, then they're going to overlook some of the things. They're going to overlook the fact that maybe there's a little bit too romance in the relationship, simply because perhaps if you were to have 100% accuracy, it wouldn't be quite as exciting. Uh, and again, it makes wonderful entertainment, is that it has been a boon to recruiting for the Navy and the Navy JAG Corps. And the Army tries to conceal historical facts. Screen versions spark intense and often difficult negotiations. Wind Talkers is the story of a closely guarded secret. In the film released in 2003, director John Woo pays tribute to Navajo Indians who served after 1942 as radio operators during the Pacific War against the Japanese. The Army created a code based on Navajo, a virtually unknown oral language. The Japanese were never able to break the code. Request fire support. We have target at 119. The Navajo's role was kept secret long after the war ended. The code itself wasn't declassified until 1968. But the scriptwriter stumbled across another secret, one far more problematic for the military. Doing the research, we found some interesting things about how, in certain cases, it might be read in that the code talkers had a bodyguard and the bodyguard might have had some orders that might be pretty serious orders that might lead to a dilemma or somebody might have to be in a position where they might have to take out their own man at war. Bad enough that you gotta kill the enemy, but if you might have to kill one of your own, we thought that could be a good nugget for a movie. No Marines were given orders to kill a Navajo code talker or any other code talker to prevent their capture. A bizarre denial, especially after Congress acknowledged it in 2000. Some code talkers were guarded by fellow Marines whose role was to kill them in case of imminent capture by the enemy. To Navajo, it was tortured to death. But the Pentagon death. held its ground over the film. One scene in particular was hotly debated. The military was adamant that the word kill not be used. What I'm about to tell you, Corporal, cannot leave this room. Under no circumstances can you allow your code talker to fall into enemy hands. Your mission is to protect the code at all costs. You understand me? Yes, sir. I do. Major Jim Deaver was the film's military yeah, advisor. The public affairs office had a uh, discussion how that should be said for the script. And that's why it doesn't say you will kill him or anything like that. It would say you will protect the code at any cost. Your mission 
detected the code. We ended up saying it more um, subtly in the film, what the Nick Cage character's orders would be. And in a way, that seemed to us to be better anyway. The director outsmarted military officials. John Woo went ahead and filmed the scene when the kill order was given, which the Marines wanted to avoid at all cost. The Marines hoped to leave an element of doubt, but the scene's quick editing and close-up shots made everything clear. He's giving the... He's giving the okay, he says, do it, you know. He wants the character Enders, Nicolas Cage, to kill him. So he's giving him the nod. He doesn't want to come a, a prisoner of war because he knows the knowledge that he has will kill a lot of Marines in the future if the Japanese broke the code. So in this scene here, how John Wu put it, uh, Roger Willie is telling them, telling Enders to kill him. However, I have to say that when I saw the picture, I thought we had failed in our attempt to achieve that, that the filmmakers had succeeded in, in fact, making it seem that Marines did get those orders. And so, you know, that's something where we, we didn't get what I felt we were trying to get. I... To prevent this kind of mishap in the future, the Pentagon now prefers to work with directors and producers it can trust. People who have made several movies that have our support, for example, of course, Jerry Bruckheimer has done several movies that have been about the military, so we pretty much know how he operates, and he has a good idea how we operate, and that makes it a whole lot easier when you know what to expect from each other. Um, people like Steven Spielberg, uh, some of the people at Paramount, because they made all those Tom Clancy novels into movies, they're people who have the experience to know what's possible and what's not, and that does make it easier to work with them. You know, you develop a rapport and you stand on your work. So when you know when you you come in the door and you say, I, "I produced Black Hawk Down," or "I did Pearl Harbor," or "I did Crimson Tide," or "Top Gun," they say, "Oh, okay, I like those movies," or "I didn't like those movies." <laughs> but in most cases with the military, they like what we've done and how they, how we portrayed them, and that's why we get the access and we get the you know the uh, the military hardware. That cooperation has stretched beyond making movies. Jerry Bruckheimer sold the military on his idea for a reality show, Profiles from the Front Line filmed in the battlefield with U.S. troops in Afghanistan. Co-produced by Bertram Van Munster, the series is a direct byproduct of the September 11th attacks. The idea of Profile started when the war in Afghanistan started after 9-11, and they were looking for Al-Qaeda. I thought, you know, this is a perfect opportunity to do something, you know, to, to film this. And I wanted to be part of that. So we had a meeting with the Pentagon, and we spoke to the people from CENTCOM, and said, would it be okay if we go out there and do this? They said, yeah, absolutely, go right ahead. We went out there. Where I went to Bagram. I went to, we spent a lot of time in eastern Afghanistan. I was in the JFK. Uh, we were in the Straits of Hormuz. We were in Kuwait. We were in Bahrain. We were in Frankfurt. We were everywhere. I had crews everywhere. And we followed basically the whole development of the war in Afghanistan. Well, it's not surprising that the Pentagon would let people go in who they had complete control over. Matthew Felling is media director for the Center for Media and Public Affairs in Washington, an independent research center that analyzes news stories. He is outraged by what he sees as collusion. The people who were affiliated with Profiles from the Front Line were sort of uh, de facto Pentagon staff members because they had pretty much signed over all control to the people within the Pentagon, within the U.S. Department of Defense. So the Pentagon would only naturally allow them a little bit more leeway because they knew that they, they, wouldn't get, they wouldn't get out of line. Meanwhile, if you have somebody from Harper's Magazine, if you have somebody from ABC who's critical of the war, you're not going to allow them to... To, to lift up all the rugs and see the dirt that he shuffled under it or, or see the mistakes that are made. Uh, but the Pentagon didn't allow that to come out. Uh, and the, to a sense, they lost the humanity of war and the, the, the truth and the accuracy of the story being told. It feels a little bit more like a commercial than it does a documentary. The series films real soldiers, not actors. The crew is really out in the battlefield. The product looks like a documentary. But Profiles presents a sanitized version of war. No one dies. 
There is much to do about the great merits of the Special Forces, America's new heroes. The problem is, as soon as the fighting gets close, the cameras are turned off. We were not there when they threw the big bombs out of the airplanes, but uh, the war, as we saw it, was what, what went on. What you see there is what went on when we were there. This is war. This is the real thing, you know? It's not about the... It's, the war, war is not about big explosions. War is about small stuff, you know? How it is nowadays, you know? It's very different from what people think it is. Everybody still thinks the beach is Normandy, you know? It's not like that. The series gave the military the idea of embedding journalists with its forces during the war in Iraq, instead of just turning them loose. One thing we achieved, I think, uh, since we were actually the first one to be kind of embedded or be with military people out in the battlefield for since many, many, many years, I think it was very helpful for the journalists to go into Iraq and be fully embedded. I think, I think we had something to do with that, and, uh, and I'm very proud of that. The military liked profile so much that when it was getting ready to wage war in Iraq, Pentagon officials went looking for Van Munster and made him their official filmmaker. We were approached by the Pentagon and asked if, we, if I had some camera teams that I wanted to send into Iraq, you know, to follow the, the aftermath of the war in Iraq, and I rounded up some people uh, that went in there, and we filmed, we filmed the aftermath of the war in Iraq. Yeah. You are not going to do a series on I'm not doing anything with that material that belongs to the Pentagon, yeah. So they say, I understand you were hired by them? We were hired by them to give them that material, yeah. No one has ever forced a director to make his bed with the military. Author and former CIA agent Robert Baer believes Hollywood, too, has its own agenda, beyond just making movies. Well, because they're fascinated by Washington because they think they can influence people. They have a much bigger role. Uh, and it's just like a lot of actors, like Arnold Schwarzenegger is going into politics, or Ronald Reagan, because for them, Hollywood's not enough. They want to carry on this influence into politics, and I think they're doing it now. Um, maybe they think they're working at the margins and they're going to make a difference for better. Uh, the problem is that California, where Hollywood people are, is a far, far away from Washington. They don't really understand it. And on the other side, for the filmmaker, it's just... Access. That's the way the White House works, same way. You prove your loyalty to the president, you prove you're going to support what his programs are, and they'll call you in and give you access. In recent years, the ties between the Defense Department and the studios have stretched well beyond the realm of show business as witnessed by this building built in 1999 in downtown Los Angeles. The Pentagon spent $50 million to create the Institute for Creative Technologies, the laboratory of the future. Military officials hired a full cast of film professionals, directors, screenwriters, special effects technicians, to come up with new tools to train soldiers for warfare. The Institute is headed by Richard Lindheim, former head of special effects at Paramount. Now comes the Vistarama immersive digital experience, and it puts you in the picture. You are at the Institute for Creative Technologies in Marina del Rey, California. And you're at a facility which was designed by Herman Zimmerman, who's the production designer of Star Trek. All this will be possible as ICT continues to develop the technology of the future. For the past five years, the ICT has been developing battle simulation technology for the US military. Flat World Project merges media technology with cinema stagecraft. Digital Scientist Gerald Pear demonstrates his star program. In an actual training scenario, a soldier could basically use these virtual portals to view action occurring outside the room. Interesting. So here are the soldiers wearing special glasses that give him an enhanced sense of depth. The screen does not look flat. And as you see here, the soldier can observe a uh, helicopter moving. And one of the advantages of the system is the fact that uh, he can also open this other door and have another viewpoint.
You can also change the entire surface of the uh, digital flat. For example, now we are giving the appearance that we're inside a cave overlooking a vast desert. However, in this case, we have a butterfly. And to this soldier, this butterfly will appear to pop out of the screen and float in the middle of the room. He is able to look under the butterfly, and he can also look around it and look around the corner. Basically, they may have a real radio in their hand. A commander may be t asking them to observe activity out here. They may see a tank or a truck, and the commander may ask them to evaluate whether this is an enemy truck or a civilian truck. And um, the soldier will be faced, you know, will have to make a decision of whether this truck should be uh, neutralized or whether it's something they should let pass by. Decision making training is one of you know, our key focus here. This prototype is already being used to train combat units. Other simulators created by ICT look more like traditional video games. But they incorporate far more sophisticated technology than those sold on the open market. The scenarios are always drawn up to reflect United States defense strategy. The scenario used in this simulator is based on US soldiers' experiences in Bosnia. It was put together by Larry Touch, the writer behind the series Columbo. The story? An American army unit out on assignment comes across a GI patrol that has been involved in a car accident that left a child seriously injured. In this type of simulation, the soldier must decide whether to order his unit to stay and attend to the injured child, or to keep going and complete its initial mission. The exercise tests the soldier's reaction in unexpected battlefield situations. The simulator belongs to the Pentagon, which holds the rights to everything invented at the ICT. The studio can market civilian versions of the game. What does Hollywood do? What, is, what do games do? They put you in that situation. So having Hollywood writers writing real characters, creating the kind of situations that can exist, is really the first attempt at being able to use that kind of expertise in a learning environment to train to leaders to make better decisions. This new trend grew even stronger after September 11th. At the Pentagon's request, the ICT set up a series of meetings between military officials and 30 Hollywood creators in downtown Los Angeles. The main focus was on current threats to the United States. David Engelbach, scriptwriter for the cult series MacGyver, attended the meetings. Can you give us some examples of what was uh, decided or what No. Was... So is any reason why you cannot? Because they asked us not to discuss these things. I mean, we did sign agreements of confidentiality. And because this is an ongoing process, and because we are still involved, we as a country and the government, is still involved in pursuing um, um, international terrorism, we were not told to avoid talking about certain things. It's just, I think, common sense, and given the nature of what we, the sensitive nature of what we discussed, that I, I wouldn't feel comfortable talking about that. Uh, I did, in fact, go last summer to uh, uh, the Carnegie Institute for Peace in Washington at, at their request to attend a seminar on uh, radical Islam, which I found to be very useful. Um, only as kind of background that uh, for if there were other opportunities to, or, uh, to meet and discuss stuff, I would have more information. Is the Pentagon trying to influence script content? Though Hollywood denies it, the backstory in recent films and video games has changed dramatically. In the latest simulators developed by the ICT, for instance, the situation may be imaginary, but the setting is very suggestive. The adversary's clothing and the Arab-like scenery leave no doubt about the culture posing the threat. The enemy is Muslim. The Iraq and Afghanistan wars hover nearby. selling propaganda, either flag-waving or critical propaganda. Uh, but I think it helps to, to understand what people would be reacting to, because we are involved in a culture. 
uh, uh, a conflict of cultures, whether we like it or not. If the Cold War lasted, what, from the end of World War II until the breakup of the Soviet Union, that was 50 years. I think we're looking at another 50 years of, of conflict between um, radical Islam and uh, democratic, in the democratic West. We have seen a lot of ideas uh, for movies involving special forces, particularly. Uh, whether it be based on real incidences in, in Afghanistan, particularly, or uh, just, gee, that was a great image of those guys on horseback in Afghanistan, which we all saw all around the world, and the thought that um, a modern army is now going back to horseback. Well, that's, that got all these people thinking, special forces, gee, how cool are they? Let's do a movie about that. So there has been a lot more interest in doing something like that. Are you pleased that there is this interest? Very pleased. Um, it, it, I'm pleased in one way, particularly, in that it's um, an interest in the modern army. Uh, most movies have, uh, in the past, in the more recent past, have been set at a different time. So it would be nice to see a movie that actually shows what we do today. This is an old idea of an alliance between Hollywood and the government. It's not something new. Uh, it did work. It brought us into a war. I mean, the, the alliance with the news networks, cable news networks, Hollywood, and a White House disinformation office has convinced Americans that a war in Iraq was a war against terrorism, which I think today we, we know is not the case. Um, I think that Hollywood is misleading for many people because that's where a lot of people get their information from in the United States, is from Hollywood, or their, or their ideas and their concepts. Saving Private Jessica was the first fictionalized movie on the war in Iraq. It was broadcast in November on NBC. Whether or not Jessica's story was a real rescue or a publicity stunt, we may never know. But one thing is certain, film studios are still one of the best tools for putting a positive spin on war. Thank you.